A fleet of 50 army trucks and carriers from the 16th Air Defence Regiment stationed at Woodside, South Australia, arrived at Williamtown overnight and were joined by more this afternoon. Equipped with radiant surface-to-air missiles, they, along with US troops on Red Eye missiles, will be the ground defence during next week's eight simulated enemy air raids, which commence on Wednesday. They will be strategically positioned around Williamtown while assisting the repelled strike attack of F-111s and F-4s from Brisbane's Army Base, including Mirages, and the contingent of 10 US F-15s, which arrived last night from Japan. Colonel Tom Owens was tight-lipped about the role they'd be playing during the exercise, saying that as much of the information was classified, only the obvious could be stated. The role of the F-15s, although I, I cannot be uh, that specific, we will we will uh, perform the mission for which the airplane was designed. That's your uh, basic air superiority and air defense in conjunction with the, uh, with the Australian Air Force. The raids on Williamtown should not only test the capabilities of the US and Australian planes and pilots, but more importantly, according to Wing Commander Ken Johnson, they should also highlight any flaws in Williamtown's defense network. Obviously there are going to be some errors uh, uh, found throughout the system. Uh, that's why we're running the exercises to improve our air defense system. And um, I'd, I'd imagine we'd find some holes, but yes, uh, overall I think we should do fairly well. It's morning peak hour in Tokyo and almost 13 million people make their way to work. The Japanese have held a long fascination with the West, but now the curiosity has gone down under. Australia mania has hit, spearheaded by the koala. The Japanese love koalas, but now the future export of our cuddly ambassadors is in doubt. The animals are suffering a form of stress syndrome. Two days ago, a koala from Queensland died. Last week, one of the Sydney females, named Purple, also died, and to mark the tragedy, zoo officials held a full funeral service. Concerned about the deaths, Premier Rann has cast doubt over future exports. And I'd really uh, like to pause for a while and uh, see what is uh, the cause of the death of the koala that we sent up here uh, before we make any uh, decision. Well, despite Purple's funeral, Pink's wedding will still go ahead when Premier Ran tomorrow plays marriage celebrant at a three-way wedding with Sydney's other two male koalas, Tam Tam and Tom Tom. Earlier today, the Hunter Valley's marching koalas welcomed Mr Ran and Tokyo's Governor Suzuki to the opening of the New South Wales exhibition. Governor Suzuki joined in the fun and for some authentic Aussie flavour, Bush Ballads Japan style. That's right, Crick go the shears. At his home in Walls End today, Chad Stevenson proudly showed off the trophy and medals he won for his six winning performances. He broke records in the 100 metres, the javelin and the shot put, and backed these up with wins in the 200 metres, the discus and the long jump. Some observers believe his performance is the best of the CHS titles in more than 30 years, giving Stevenson good reason in to be the last pleased. Three days. Oh, very pleased because I haven't done much training for the events. So were you surprised when you won most of the events there that you went in? Yeah, sure was. What do you consider to be your best performance there? The 100 metres where I recorded my personal best. You recorded other personal bests there. How happy were you with those? I was very happy because I haven't done much training for the events. You won the most outstanding, you won the award as the most outstanding athlete there. Were you surprised when you won it considering you're so young? Yeah, because I thought I'd be a fair bit too young to win the trophy. Right, so what do you see in the future for yourself? Uh, hopefully um, improve me with my athletics and hopefully Commonwealth Games. A 
large crowd of car enthusiasts turned out for the auction, Ken Delforce has been quietly putting cars aside that caught his eye when traded at one of his many car yards. The collection was so big that a special garage was built. The 40 collector items were all put up for bid. The oldest car up for grabs, this 1927 Chrysler Tourer. The collection also boasts every model Valiant produced since the cars were released in 1962. Each of the cars is in original condition. Even Ken's Mitsubishi Pajero, which this year took him to 31st place in the Sydney to Darwin Safari. OK, it's taken you this long to get the collection together. Why in the world are you selling it? Oh, well, as you probably know, we've had a bit of luck with uh, horses lately. We've had a horse that's um, won us a few dollars last year, and we think he's going to win a few more. And uh, right now, I think that uh, horses interest me more than cars. It has been an interest in life for me and it's been kept me active for years and I enjoy doing it. If I didn't, I wouldn't be doing it. Certainly will. It. You've seen some great footballers go through lakes yeah. in that time, Rich. 1958, 59 or 60, I was the first, first grade manager. That was the 59th year of the first year of the Marlborough Cup. Right. And, uh, I think I did have a couple of years with the reserve grade too, but the under the third grade and under twenty threes was the were the teams. I've been asked by the boys to stand again next year. You gonna go around again next year? Well I've been asked to. Yeah, you'll have a think about it. Yes. <laughs> You're eighty four these days, Rich. It's uh you know, it's a fairly demanding job for a fellow of your years, I guess. Oh, but uh I enjoy doing it, so You might continue. I'd, I have a mate with me. Right. Yes. Right, right. <laughs> Over the years with Lakes United, some great footballers. Are you prepared to tell us who you think the best one's been in that time? Yes, I think uh, Albert Paul was a great footballer. And uh, Alan Thompson, you've got to say those two would be the best because they both went to England. Certainly. Yeah. Plenty of other good ones. Uh, Johnny Craig comes Craig, to my Johnny, mind. Johnny Craig, Ronnie Davis, Killer Davis, oh yeah, and uh, Graham Huggins. He is a good footballer. I guess you've got to talk about fellows like Ivor Wolf. Oh yes, Ivan Wolf. Russell Norton. Russell Norton. Gus Shepherd, I suppose. Vernon Lee. They all went round and round, didn't they? They're all top-class footballers. As you said, uh, Trevor Andrews, yes. Gary Wilkinson, Johnny Clouton from Wyong, Mal Stewart, Bruce Stewart from the entrance, uh, Rod, uh, was it Rod Scott? Yes, from, yeah. Uh, Bobby Scott is Bobby now, Scott, yes, yeah, yeah, played hooker for you from down the yes, central coast. That's right. We're going yeah. to miss plenty, but you can't miss fellows like young Tommy Shepherd, I don't suppose, Glenny yes. Golden. Virgo, of course, Ronnie oh, Burgess, Ronnie great Burgess players. Great fellow, and great fellow too. And, uh, Tony Johnny Shields. Bro uh, Johnny Brock. Yes, Shields. Yes. Tony Reg, I suppose Peter that was Shields. the that was the good era for, for Lakes when they won it two years in a row after winning it in 1947 to win it in 74-75. They were the days, and just now, of course, in 1985, when the Seagulls ruled the roost, didn't they, in that time? Yes, yes they were, that was real good, those, both those games. standing quarter mile. Local driver Alan Legg took out the unblown hydro section with his boat Ace clocking 106.6 mph. The limited alcohol section went to Jasper with Stan Tyndall of Wyong with a best speed of 104.7 miles an hour. Justice driven by Sydney driver Ray Carroll placed first in the blown alcohol division with a speed of 101.8. The limited hydro class went to Karua driver Bruce Lyle in stress factor with 91.2, while the ski modified went to Peter Storner in Peter Rabbit, clocking 78.15.
The feature of the day was the exhibition drive of Russ Mills in Coal Runner, who clocked 161.57 miles per hour, going easy in his brain height. In 1975, the Newcastle Helicopter Rescue Service launched a volunteer operation which was to become a valuable unit in the Hunter region. With a crew of 12, the service was originally intended for surf rescue only. But as helicopter director and one of the three original crew members left, Terry Mulville says that role soon changed. Well, the original uh, service that I see? started off with uh, was quite enjoyable. We just flew up and down the beaches and looked for sharks and rips and uh, in the odd occasion rescued someone from the water. But now uh, we're involved uh, in quite a large uh, spectrum of operations in, in quite a wide and varied range. Celebrations for 10 years of service were held on the weekend and it was a time for others to show their appreciation. I was presented with uh, plaques from the police rescue squad and from our sister service in Sydney and also a perpetual trophy from our original founding uh, director here in Newcastle, Evan Walton, for the crewman of the year and uh, several other smaller trophies. Can you see the service continuing in Newcastle? Well, there's a definite need here for, the, for a rescue service. It can't be done without. Whether or not it continues in this particular role um, or whether it's modified in future years, I don't really know. This year, the Upper Hunter Wine Festival is 10 years old, a milestone for the vignerons and people from the towns in the Upper Hunter who, over the years, have worked so hard to make the festival a success. This year, seven wineries took part and a new system was introduced at the tastings. On arrival in the area, festival goers were able to buy souvenir glasses for $4. These included 12 tasting tickets, which allowed entry and free tastings at each of the participating wineries. Arrowfield Wines recorded 5,500 tastings yesterday. The numbers ease today, but that isn't surprising as Monday is traditionally a day for buying. Visitors have by then seen what each vineyard has to offer and made their selections. While the idea of the festival is to introduce visitors to the region's produce, it's also a celebration for the vignerons. The October long weekend coincides with Budburst, when the new season shoots make their first appearance. These vines at the Denman Estate were completely bare 10 days ago. But thanks to the recent fine hot weather, the new buds have made their appearance. The Denman Estate General Manager, Cedric the Balance. Vines at? Well, the vines at this stage are just pre-flowering uh, or capping, as we call it. And if you look here carefully, you can see there's the beginning of the fruit. At that stage it's like a little raspberry and it has a little cap coming on it which holds pollen. In a fortnight's time those pollen caps will explode and pollinate each and every one of those, we hope. If the conditions are perfect, we get 100%. If we get bad conditions, we might only get 50%. So that's the ups and downs of, of the uh, climate uh, and the industry. <laughs> but the weekend celebrations didn't end with the wine. The emphasis was on making it a family affair, and outdoor activities such as horse riding, picnicking and joy flights encouraged just that. Many of the wineries also offered art and craft displays, at Sobel's Queldenburg Winery, an outdoor pottery display proved popular. While at Denman, visitors escape from the heat at the winery gallery, which nestles among the insulated fermentation tanks where the estate's premium white wines are made. Celebrations also extended to the towns of the Upper Hunter, and one way of seeing all the sites was by steam train. The Lachlan Valley Rail Society provided the locomotive, which operated return trips between Musselburgh and Denman during the three days of the wine festival. has been leasing the building in Market Street for three years and now over 200 young people between the ages of 9 and 18 will have a permanent centre for their activities. Okay. The building will now be refurbished in general measures. The President of the House has now given the muscle group to the place to send it We've got somewhere now that we can actually say it is our own 
uh, which has given the youth of Musselbrook uh, a more secure feeling of uh, not having to, to move uh, premises, uh, which would have been the case had we not been successful with our tender. Two months ago, the Combined Mining Union at Drayton was approached to assist in the purchase of the building. Union President Kevin Odgers says the proposal for support of the centre well, first had Anna, to be put was, before the uh, members and staff. The they decided to uh, contribute each week by a payroll deduction and uh, purchase the building instead of just supporting them uh, for two or three weeks or a month or so, so as that the place could keep going. We would rather purchase it and uh, that way it belongs to the, uh, the people of Musselbrook. The the mine management has also been involved, supplying a refundable deposit of over $8,000 in legal help and assistance in organising finance. In a surprise move last week, the CSR board on site of Drayton also announced they would provide a cash grant of $7,500 for equipment for the centre. It's expected the centre will be up and running in its new form in around a month. The photograph collection is the property of Newcastle resident Bert Lovett. For some time he's been concerned about the collection and has sought support to house it in a place with public access. Newcastle administration today approved a recommendation to house the collection in the regional library. The photos provide a record of historic events and buildings in Newcastle and its surrounding districts. Carl Oval Belmont was the venue of the 20th Special Education Carnival, where more than 250 students from 17 schools competed in 153 events. Lakeside Public School played host this year, and according to Principal Peter Lewis, these kids get as much from the competition as other children, if not more. Well, for our mother section, we have 117, and for our uh, severe profound, this was the first time we've had these events, there's 32 events. What's the motive behind it? Well, the motive behind the carnival is to bring the number of schools in the Hunter region, particularly our OF schools, together and um, allow them to participate in a sporting atmosphere where they get the feeling of um, companionship, as well as uh, joining in, having a wonderful time, and also the element of competition. Have you noticed that there's been an improvement oh, in their disposition? marked improvement. And uh, I think you judge by the uh, cheering and the clapping that's going on, there's a tremendous feeling and atmosphere here today. Horse racing has the Melbourne Cup and in football it's the Winfield Cup. But for the women's bowlers of the Newcastle District and the Central Coast, this is their most prized possession. The Rose Bowl Trophy, fought out today at the Wanji Bowling Club. Who takes it home in 85? Find out tonight on the NBN News at 6. Around three quarters of the 290 parish representatives from throughout the Newcastle Diocese voted for the ordination of women as deacons in this morning's first session of the annual synod at the Morpeth Conference Centre. Although the issue has been debated long and hard over many years, the vote still came as something of a surprise, according to the Dean of Newcastle, the very Reverend Graham Lawrence, who says it may still be some time before the first woman is ordained. The bishop uh, will need to um, further see the successful completion of the studies of those women who are already accepted candidates for the Diocese of Newcastle and uh, he of course won't ordain anyone until they have uh, completed their theological studies successfully. Do you see this as being the first move towards having women priests and women bishops? Um, it certainly is the first step, yes. Um, the order of deacon as you know is the first step in the threefold order of ministry of bishop, priest and deacon and uh, it's the first step, though in our church we've said no further for another couple of years.
This course has been funded by the federal government as a skills in demand type of course and currently throughout New South Wales at the moment the College of Nursing in New South Wales is running a number of refresher courses and this is the first course in Newcastle and we're hoping to run another course next year if we get enough response. The course is being held at Walls End Hospital and will involve six weeks of theory and six weeks practical work with an experienced registered nurse. New South Wales has for some time had a chronic shortage of nurses and the courses are believed to be one way of luring ex-nurses back into the workforce either on a full-time or permanent part-time basis. Sister Maunter says many ex-nurses did not have enough confidence in their ability to come back and nurse. How far will this course go towards easing the nursing shortage in the state? It's a very minute answer at the moment. We have a reasonable type of nursing shortage in Newcastle. Uh, we're hoping that these people will help us with our nursing shortage, but we feel there are a lot more people, a lot more registered nurses who could come back into the workforce, perhaps even on a part-time basis, working one or two or three days a week.